events that deal with uh, Palestine and other issues that are happening in the Middle East. Thank you all for being part of this. Uh, this is kind of like personal to me. It's like catharsis. You know, you need this kind of group to come together to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, I hope you feel the same way. Um, there's, uh, there are several events that are happening in town, and I want to always take an opportunity uh, during this kind of gathering to make any announcements that anyone might have. Uh, because uh, solidarity is really important at this time. So um, I know that Medea Benjamin, who's been like, geez, uh, everywhere in Congress, <laughs> and, and Tyke Berry, of course, and so many others that are involved with Code Pink have been such an important part of, uh, of the movement to keep uh, Congress on its uh, toes, so to speak, and keep them uh, on the run, literally. Uh, if you've been watching the videos. Uh, so I wanted to bring up Medea to, to make some announcements about what's happening. If anybody else would like to make an announcement also, please come up forward and, and share your, uh, your uh, event or whatever is happening. Um, one event that is taking place is we've been having uh, a, a, a bit of difficulty, not a bit, a lot of difficulty actually, trying to convince our city council here in D.C. to pass a ceasefire resolution. And, um, you know, for obviously for some obvious reasons they had the Israeli embassy there giving them a, a briefing about what happened shortly after October the 7th and uh, I think they've been really stuck in the mud on this issue and they need to move and uh, we've been lobbying them uh, on and off uh, interrupting their meetings and um, there's an event happening on Saturday you know a lot of the uh, council members uh, do these kind of coffees in different parts of town to meet the constituents um, and, uh, and I say constituents because I don't know who they're meeting because 70% to 80% of the city wants to have a ceasefire, but yet they're not representing us. So I don't know who these constituents are they're meeting and what they're going to say to them. But anyway, um, the one of the key people is, of course, the, um, the chairman, who is Phil Mendelson. And Phil has refused to uh, introduce this or bring it up forward, or, and he would even be an obstacle if it does come forward. So he's going to be having a coffee with the community, a lot of this, um, uh, on, uh, uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday. What's the date Saturday? 23rd. The 23rd. On Saturday the 23rd at 1 p.m. at the Potter's House. The Potter's House is on Columbia Road. Uh, so he's, it's a small place, not that big of a place. So I urge you to show up. We have a, a lot of people that have already signed up that want to go. But I think if we show numbers and we show solidarity, I think we'll send a very strong message to the chairman of the board uh, of the council that we uh, here in the city uh, mean business when we ask for something that the city, that most of the people in the city want to see, uh, and he's refusing to introduce it. When I confronted him at a city council hearing, I said, 80% of the city wants to see a ceasefire. Why aren't you speaking up? I said, who are you representing? And his answer was, Nobody. That was exactly what he said to me. And uh, I thought, well, if you're representing nobody, why are you there? And so th that's, that's the bottom line, right? So they've become so flippant about this uh, that I think they seem very comfortable in just saying whatever they want to say. And they feel like the, um, the uh, something is in their favor and want to make sure that they know that not, that uh, if they don't uh, speak up and represent the people of the city, and represent humanity that they don't belong on the city council or being representatives for us. So I want to bring up uh, <laughs> I want to bring up uh, Medea to say a couple things. If anybody else would like to say something, please come on up to the front. So um, how many of you have been with us in the halls of Congress at all? Look around, a lot of people. So a big thank you to um, those of you who've been coming with us, even if it's for one day, or some people here have been like almost every day, but we are there every single day, and it really does start to get to them. It's like they say, uh-oh, you again, and they start running the other way. But, you know, it, it, we have to keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this uh, until they change their policies. And the policy, you know, um, in the beginning it was call for a ceasefire, call for a ceasefire. Now a lot of them have called for a ceasefire. They have a different meaning of ceasefire than, than we do. Um, but uh, now we're saying don't vote for any bill that gives more money to the Israeli military. 
and uh, they have been, you know, all kinds of machinations to figure out how they're going to get that bill to the floor. They're going into recess starting next week for two weeks, so that gives us more time to go and talk to the staff. Um, so anyway, I think it's really important that we keep doing this. And I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet. Anybody who wants to get on our WhatsApp group or be informed about how you can join us in Congress, um, please sign up there. And also, I don't know if you've heard the latest news, but the Speaker Mike Johnson has s extended an invitation to Netanyahu mm. to speak before Congress. Insane. Insane. And Schumer, who has you know, criticized Netanyahu, now has had to say, oh, of course we would welcome him to come. So it will be to a joint session of Congress, we don't know when, but we want to react immediately and do a protest tomorrow at Mike Johnson's office and also at Schumer's office. So if, you're po if you have a possibility or you know anybody who could join, tomorrow we meet the way we meet every single day, 10 o'clock a.m. in the Rayburn Cafeteria, and then we go off from there. So well, raise your... How do you get to the Rayburn Cafeteria? You go to Capitol South Metro, get off, walk to the Rayburn Building, enter through the Capitol South entrance, go down one floor, and, or no, go around the corner and you're at the cafeteria. Right, yeah. R raise your hand if maybe you could join us tomorrow. I see some hands, but not enough. So that would be great. We have to have an immediate reaction to what they said. And I have one other announcement, which is, where's Andy? He's up there. We need, uh, tell, we need Andy, because it's his birthday. Um, so we're going to sing a song, but it's not the traditional happy birthday song. It's a more cool song. So if you could just kind of clap or something as we go along. Okay, so one, two, three. Happy birthday, happy, happy birthday. We're in love with you, love with you. May happiness be near throughout the coming year and all the best to you, best to you. May you smile every day and may your troubles fade away and may you never, ever, ever be blue. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday to you. We love you, Andy. There's no way to follow that up. <laughs> wow, yes, and Andy, wherever you are, yes, we do really love you. So I did want to also announce, I'm with Jewish Voice for Peace. I'm Shelly Cohen Fudge. And we're going to have an event on April the 24th at the Bus Boys at Tacoma Park for the author of Palestine Hijacked. Love the title. Palestine hijacked how Zionism forged an apartheid state from the river to the sea. And the author is Tom Suarez. So it's on the 24th, 6 p.m., and hope to see you there. Norman Finkelstein will be in Washington, D.C. for one night only. Um, March the 31st at 5 o'clock, but I'm not sure which location. 14th Street location, 5 p.m. Um, he'll, be, um, he'll be answering questions and saying a few words. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight uh, for this important discussion about Palestinian resistance and liberation and Tarek Bakoni's book, Hamas Contained. We here at Busboys and Poets, alongside all of you, have been watching with horror as the siege on Gaza continues and the civilian death count rises day by day. In partnership with Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, African Studies Program, and Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, tonight we present part two of the Gaza lecture series, What Was Hamas Thinking? Our Busboys and Poets servers will be helping us with putting in orders throughout the program. 
I also want to remind you that there will be a Q&A and book signing after the discussion, and Hamas Contain will be available for purchase alongside a selection of books about Palestine, the Palestine-Israeli conflict, and the 1948 Nakba. For this part of the Gaza Lecture Series, historian Tarek Bakoni has joined us on the Busboy stage. Sorry. <laughs> Um, to share his scholarly and personal experiences surrounding Israeli mass violence in Palestinian territories, and to discuss how Hamas came to be and what Palestinian resistance looks like moving forward. Joining him in this conversation is Dr. Nader Hashemi, Associate Professor of Middle East and Islamic Politics at Georgetown University. Um, Tarek Bakoni serves as the President of the Board of Al Shabaka. He was Al Shabaka's U.S. Policy Fellow from 2016 to 2017. Tarek is the former senior analyst for Is Israel, Palestine, and Economics of Conflict at the International Crisis Group based in Ramallah, and the author of Hamas Contained, The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian Resistance. Tarek's writing has appeared in the London Review of Books, the New York Review of Books, and Washington Post, among others. And he is a frequent commentator in regional and international media. He is the book review editor for the Journal of Palestine Studies. Dr. Nader Hashemi is the director of Al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and an associate professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Uh, so, uh, so without further ado, we introduce our speakers. Thank you everyone for coming, and um, I really want to begin with a, a shout out to Andy and his team here at Bus Boys and Poets. In the past, when we've tried to organize events, specifically on this topic, at the last moment the event gets canceled because there's outside pressure, and it's really good to know that, you know, Andy is on the telephone when someone calls and tells people to, you know, go where they need to go when they complain um, about open discussion and, and analysis of the Israel-Palestine conflict. So, uh, so thank you, Andy, for being here. And I also want to clarify that this lecture series that we're organizing in conjunction with Busboys and Poets is not officially sponsored by Georgetown University. It's sponsored by three academic centers at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. So I don't want any confusion um, to exist in anyone's mind, lest my dean call me and, um, um, compl and, and, and ask for an explanation. So the format is that Tarek and I are going to have a conversation um, about uh, the Israel-Palestine Israel -Palestine conflict, focusing specifically on what's happening in Gaza today. And we're going to begin with a discussion of Hamas. I consider Tarek to be one of the leading uh, experts um, on uh, this particular topic and this particular movement. His book that was announced, um, Hamas Contained, um, is widely regarded as one of the best analysis of this particular topic, and Tark has written for uh, many um, uh, important publications, um, such as the London Review of Books, New York Review of Books, Washington Post, and he wrote a very fascinating piece in foreign policy in November, after October 7th, called What Was Hamas Thinking? I read it, I was really impressed by the depth of the analysis, and that led to um, his invitation to Washington, D.C. Uh, so Tark, I want to begin by um, um, quoting something that you said uh, recently, and it was quoted in The Guardian today, you can look it up, there's a long essay on Hamas and, and Tark is uh, quoted, and you're quoted as saying, the major misconception at the core of the dominant discourse about Hamas is the idea that if Hamas as a security threat was undermined, Israel would have no issue anymore with the Palestinians. Um, but you go on to say, but if Hamas were to disappear tomorrow, the Israeli blockade on Gaza and military rule in the West Bank would still remain. There is this tendency, you say, to suggest that this is a war between Israel and Hamas rather than a war between Israel and the Palestinians, which somehow places the question of Hamas outside of the social conditions and political conditions that the Palestinians are facing. And then you conclude by saying it's an inability to address the political drivers animating the Palestinians that produces this type of distorted analysis. So could you expand on that point? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I said that's a good quote. I haven't actually read the piece, so it's, uh, it's good to, to, to have it quoted back at me. Um, and thank you as well. I'm just going to echo that. Uh, 
there's a few things that's happening in that code. I think one of the things, one of the main misconceptions that uh, certainly Western media gets, and you see that in all the framing around what's happening today, is that this is an Israel-Hamas war. And the assumption underli underlying that framing is that were Hamas to put down its weapons or were Hamas to be removed from the equation, that there wouldn't be an issue, that Israel wouldn't have any problem with the Palestinians. And that's just factually incorrect. And one of the things that I write about in my book, which is to flip the equation around. Often people think that the Gaza Strip is under blockade because of Hamas. That's everyone's conception of understanding the blockade, of un understanding why Israel expends so much energy to try to put the Gaza Strip under blockade. But one of the things I argue in my book is actually that Hamas is blockaded because of Gaza that Hamas has become constrained in the Gaza Strip because of a demographic reality, because of what Gaza is. So just to unpack that a bit. Israel's issue is not one that's driven by security concerns. Israel's issue is one that's driven by demographics. There's a need to maintain Israel as a Jewish state, uh, and to do that, there needs to be a certain level of demographic engineering taking place within the land between the river and the sea. Palestinians need to be removed or appear to be removed from being directly under Israel's jurisdiction. Now, the Gaza Strip does that. The Gaza Strip is two million Palestinians, the majority of them needing or holding onto their right to return to homes in what is now Israel. If that right, the right of return, is given to Palestinians, Israel would obviously cease to exist as a Jewish state. And so what Israel does is it demographically engineers a reality whereby the Gaza Strip is removed as if it's no longer under Israel's sovereign control. It becomes something that's on the side of historic Palestine. And we often hear this discussion that Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip, therefore this is no longer Israel's problem. Uh, the reality is that Israel controls the Gaza Strip and continues to control every aspect uh, of the Gaza Strip. That kind of demographic engineering is needed to maintain Israel as, a, as a, a Jewish majority state or to have the appearance of it being a Jewish majority state. Now, if we think about the Gaza Strip specifically, um, the Gaza Strip has suffered from 12 wars since 1948, not counting the ongoing genocide. The Gaza Strip came under blockade before Hamas was even created, right? The Gaza Strip suffered from economic strangulation, from military assaults, from missions uh, targeted uh, or, or, or extrajudicial executions uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the 70s. The issue for Israel was never security. The issue was that the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip wanted to go back home. And the need to maintain the Gaza Strip as a separate entity is to try to remove that ability of, of, of Palestinians to return. So when Hamas, it's a long history and we can talk about it, but when Hamas ends up being the governing authority of the Gaza Strip, it becomes the perfect fig leaf. It becomes what justifies the blockade. Look, we need to maintain the Gaza Strip under blockade because Hamas is a terrorist organization bent on Israel's destruction. So that becomes the perfect excuse to maintain policies of containment and, and policies of blockade. But if the movement as Hamas disappears tomorrow, there's still two million Palestinians wishing to go home. The problem hasn't been resolved. Would you agree with the formulation that the problem from Israel's perspective and from the United States perspective is not Hamas, but it's really Palestinian nationalism? As long as there's a Palestinian national movement, whether it's secular or religious, we're going to have this type of dynamic and conflict. Um, and that reminds me of the PLO in the 70s and 80s. A lot of the things that we hear today from the United States and Israel about Hamas almost, you know, you know, hook, line, and sinker were said about the PLO, that they're terrorists, they're rejectionists, they can't compromise, they're allied with a foreign power, back then it was the Soviet Union. Um, I see a parallel discourse between the, the PLO in, sev in the 1970s and 80s and what Israel and the United States were saying, and today with Hamas. And the problem at the end of the day, as I understand it, is really the question of Palestinian nationalism. It won't go away, and there's an attempt to crush it. Would you agree with that formulation? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things that I was trying to do in the book, so the subtitle is The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian Resistance, and someone might say, what are you talking about? There's no pacification. Clearly Hamas has 
done what it did on October 7th, one of the things that I was trying to play with, with the subtitle, is to say that this is cyclical, that the Palestinian movement has gone through several iterations. The PLO rises and then the PLO concedes, accepts partition, and in some ways is subsumed into a Bantustan model in the Palestinian Authority, and we have another actor rising, which is Hamas. And that transition from the PLO to Hamas is almost seamless. What, ha what the PLO demanded in terms of political drivers, in terms of calling for the right of Palestinians to achieve self-determination, in, in, in dismantling Zionism, liberating historic Palestine, allowing refugees to go back, uh, the PLO concedes that, and, P and Hamas emerges that same year holding on to those exact same political drivers. Now, obviously, there's a massive difference between the PLO and Hamas, and that's an ideological difference. The PLO is a secular movement, Hamas is an Islamist movement. So the ideological garb has changed, and that ideological garb also has to do with the region, the way that the region went from pan-Arabism -Arab and secular nationalism in the 50s and 60s to into Islamism in the 70s and 80s. So there's, there's a, a regional depth that's happening here. But in terms of the Palestinian political drivers, those have been consistent. So the same way, as you say, Israel deemed the PLO a terrorist organization and suddenly negotiates when the, with the PLO when the PLO concedes defeat, that's the same formula that's imposed on Hamas. The minute Hamas lays down its weapons, right, suddenly it will cease to become a terrorist organization and Israel will engage with it because the issue isn't whether Hamas is dealing with weapons, the issue is that in conceding, it's letting go of the political drivers that animate Palestinian nationalism. And so one of the things that we should always be aware of is this goal that's now happening, that we need, to, that, that the Israeli goal that Hamas should be decimated. Let's say Hamas is removed. Let's say tomorrow Hamas completely ceases to exist as an organization. The political drivers that animate Hamas will continue to exist in some other ideological garb because the Palestinian people are still there, the Palestinians are still demanding the same things, nothing has changed. So the idea of destroying Hamas is impossible not organizationally, it's impossible politically, it's impossible in terms of you cannot erase what the Palestinian, Palestinians are demanding unless you do ethnic, ethnic cleansing and genocide, which is exactly what's happening now. So would you agree with the formula that Israel's biggest problem here, and the United States' biggest problem, it's trying to militarily resolve, which is a, a problem which is at core a political issue. It's trying to militarily you know, think that they can sort of solve a political problem, and then that will just simply perpetuate the political problem because of the underlying you know, question of Palestinian national rights. Absolutely, and that, that takes two forms. So the, the first form, so to try to, to completely destroy Palestinian nationalism, the first form is militarily. And now we're seeing a, a genocide happening and an, atten at an attempt to destroy and disable Hamas. But this is something that happened in 1982 with the PLO. When Israel invaded uh, Lebanon, there was carpet bombing, there was besiegement, there was mass population deaths in Lebanese and Palestinian centers uh, in Lebanon, and the idea was to destroy the PLO militarily, and they succeeded in the sense that the PLO was then expelled to Tunis, and politically, at least organizationally within Lebanon, it ceased to exist. Now, wh within historic Palestine, there's now an attempt to deal with this militarily. So that's the first way that Israel deals with that. But the second way is, to actually not engage at all and to manage the conflict rather than to try to resolve it. So if you have Palestinian authorities, uh, whether it's the PA or other centers that are able to govern under overarching Israeli apartheid, so they never challenge Israel's regime, they govern underneath that regime, Israel is happy with the populations. The population under its control is pacified. They don't need political rights. Uh, there's calm for Israeli citizens, and this can be maintained as long as possible. And this was the Israeli assumption around Gaza, that Gaza, you know, every few months or years, we go in, we mow the lawn, we kill a few thousand people, and there's really, we have security and the cost is manageable. But th this kind of pacification is another way of trying to just not address the political issues underpinning this. So John Kirby, who everyone knows is one of the spokes uh, people for the Biden administration, has repeatedly said that on October the 6th there was a ceasefire and Hamas broke it. And so they have to sort of, you know, bear responsibility for what's happened since then. But you said in your lecture today at Georgetown, I think quite perceptively, that violence was inherent in the status quo 
before October the 7th. That's a view that most people, I think, don't sufficiently appreciate. Could you expand on that idea about how violence was you know, inherent in the so-called st the status quo that existed before October 7th? I mean, let's, th let's think about it just in terms of the few months leading up to October 7th. Between January and October 6th of last year, more Palestinians were killed than any other year before that outside of times of spectacular violence. So this calm that Kirby's talking about, this ceasefire that existed before, more Palestinian civilians, the majority of them children, were killed than ever before. So what calm is he talking about? He's talking about calm for Israeli Jews. The only thing that matters is, are Israeli Jews being killed? Are they facing violence or not? If they're not, then there's calm. If Israeli Jews are happy, then there's calm. If Palestinians are killed, that's normalized. It's the, it's the, we're desensitized to Palestinian death. This is a degree of, of racism and dehumanization that is at the core of understanding what's happening. Now, if we think about the blockade specifically, there's two million Palestinians in Gaza about two-thirds of them are below the age of 16. So they, they've never left the Gaza Strip. Since 2007, they've been under blockade. These are people, children, who have lived through three wars, who have lived through the sniper attacks in 2018 that maimed 35,000 Palestinians, and they've lived through a reality where their food is rationed and where they cannot come in or out of an area which is it really not uh, anything that can constitute a life. That's violent. There's a violence in the structure of apartheid that is daily and relentless. And so when we talk about calm, we're talking about calm for one demographic of people. Um, okay, so let me ask you now a bit more of a challenging question. This was sent to me today by a Palestinian intellectual, and it's somewhat of a, crit a critique of Palestinian intellectuals post October the 7th. And I want you to sort of think about it and, and respond. So the question is this, notwithstanding Israel's ferocious attack on Gaza, which the world court has ruled is a plausible case for genocide, do Palestinian intellectuals make a moral mistake in not appreciating how October the 7th deeply traumatized Israel and Israelis? Are there not more efficacious ways of proceeding in talking about October the 7th, given the fact that at the end of the day, Israelis and Palestinians are going to have to live, live, live with each other. Um, and so the expectation here is, is there not something that's perhaps being missed at this moment of high emotion that's undermining the prospects of some um, you know, just settlement down the road? I mean, I think it's a good question, I, I guess, or a good observation or statement. I guess I'll, I'll say two things to that. First of all, I don't deny that October 7th has been existential for Israel. And by existential, I don't mean militarily, because there's no way that Palestinians can defeat Israel militarily. The existential threat isn't military. The existential threat is that the attack undermined a central premise of Zionism, which is that Jews can exist safely in Palestine without addressing the rights of the indigenous Palestinian population. That premise has been destroyed, and it's been destroyed irreversibly. And I think that part of the reason we're seeing such a hysterical reaction from the Israeli military is because they know that. Now, going back to October 6th is much harder. The idea that Palestinians can be put behind walls and forgotten indefinitely is no longer possible. And so really, they have to be killed or removed, right? This is an existential threat. And I think that it's an existential threat that's compounded by the fact that here we, we, we have a state that has come out of the trauma of the Holocaust. So that's not something to be dismissed. It's central to understanding what's happening here. So I do think that it is existential, and I do think that acknowledging that and dealing with it is important to try to understand the politics of Palestine and how Palestinian liberation will be achieved. So that's the first thing I'll say. The second thing t is, is, is to recognize that, yes, the only way the only way there can be justice and peace in Palestine is in a single state that's decolonized. 
That's my belief, that there's, there can only be justice in Palestine when the entirety of historic Palestine is liberated and the Israeli apartheid regime is dismantled. Now that will entail That will entail a certain degree of acknowledging uh, the settler privilege and the settler dominance and how that needs to be dismantled. So there needs to be a certain kind of engagement, obviously, with settler power. For that to happen, uh, there needs to be, uh, there need to be two things. First of all, Zionism as an ideology has to be challenged and dismantled, and I think uh, there's a lot of work that's happening. I mean, JVP sitting in the room, creating a reality where Judaism and Zionism are disentangled is a core, core uh, wi uh, uh, pillar of importance for, for Palestinian liberation. But the second thing is that Palestinians need to develop a political project that is focused on decolonization, and that's pushing that forward. After October 7th, in the absence of a project like that, which is now more vital than ever, we see the possibility not of, of a decolonial future, but of another Nakba, right? We see the possibility of Palestinians being expelled, which is why the creation of a unified Palestinian political project that's focused on full Palestinian liberation, that's grounded in a century of Palestinian politics, of the right of return, of decolonization, that is of utmost importance to revive as a vehicle for liberation. Okay, so it's a perfect segue to my next question, and that is the crisis of Palestinian national leadership. One of the tragedies of the Palestinian condition today, as I see it, is there is no effective um, broadly representative, inclusive, and incorruptible Palestinian national leadership that ideally I would like to see on the model of the African National Congress and the ANC that's internally representative, that has international credibility, has a strategy, and um, you know, has a plan for national liberation. We don't have that, and we haven't had that for a very long time. So the first question is why? Why is, among all the national liberation struggles that I can think of, is it this particular national liberation struggle that suffers from a chronic deficit of effective leadership? And I have a follow-up question, but if you could just speak to that one. It's a know, big question. It's a big question. It's a big question. But you, you know it better than anyone else, so what are your thoughts? I mean, I'll, I'll share some thoughts. I, it's a big question. So the why is really difficult to answer, and obviously it's not anything that relates to Palestinian exceptionalism because Palestinians are not exceptional either in the good sense or the bad sense. So there are obviously factors, historical factors, political factors, military factors that have resulted in this situation. It's by design. Palestinian leaders have been assassinated, they've been exiled, they've been imprisoned, they've been uh, uh, pacified for decades, right? And we have a reality where the Palestinian Liberation Organization, as, as a movement that emerged with the third world anti-colonial revolutions, um, was, uh, as other anti-colonial movements were, deemed a terrorist organization, and I think there was a fundamentally flawed, almost fatal mistake in Yasser Arafat's acceptance of partition in the 1980s, because that legitimated Zionism, it legitimated the idea that Zionism and the colonization of historic Palestine was okay within the borders of the 67 line, and it created, it shifted the Palestinian movement away from a politics of liberation and into a politics of state building that's, and this is a scholarly term, bullshit. And so we have a situation in which now, instead of talking about liberation, we're talking about state building under apartheid. Right? And so it creates this reality where the PLO and the politics of liberation get subsumed into a politics of governance. So structurally, that's what happens. So that's sort of the first reason, and obviously that's a long history. But the second reason, and this is crucial, is that the, the Zionist, Zionist colonialism has been really effective at fragmentation. The Palestinian people have been really uh, 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 have, have struggled under fragmentation. So even today, when we're talking about resuscitating a Palestinian leadership, right, what does that entail? That entails getting Palestinian citizens of Israel on board. It get, entails getting Palestinians in Jordan who have refugee status on board. It gets Palestinians here on board. That, that, that politics is destabilizing. It's destabilizing to Jordan. It's destabilizing to Lebanon. It's destabilizing here in the U.S. It's destabilizing in 48. 
So that fragmentation has really been effective in terms of preventing Palestinians from creating institutions of liberation that are representative and that speak to all 14 million of us. Now, having said that in, in a sort of a, a, a pessimistic tone, there's also been incredible mobilization in Palestinian unity. 2021 was a turning point mm -hmm. in which Palestinians emerged as a singular people from the river to the sea against a singular regime of apartheid. That's, that we're coming out of the state building agenda. We're coming out of the Oslo debacle and we are entering a century of liberation. We are entering that period. Right? And I think today, actually, the, the apartheid regime is weaker than it's ever been uh, before. And so I think that gives reason for hope. So Jim, let me push you a bit more on that. So what's your preferred sort of model of a future credible Palestinian leadership? The debate seems to be around two particular options, restructuring and revising the institutions of the PLO, or completely putting that in the history bin and creating something new. Do you have any thoughts on sort of the way forward? It's a very, it's a very difficult question because, because there's, no ri there's no clear right answer. So the issue with the PLO is that obviously the PLO as it exists today is unrepresentative and illegitimate. Uh, and it doesn't represent the Palestinian people. It's been subsumed into the body of the PA. At the same, ti at the same time, the PLO has diplomatic and legal, legal character on the international stage. So giving up on the PLO, giving up on the PLO missions is a hugely costly endeavor, right? And so this is, this is where the fault line is. There are people who say you cannot give up on what the PLO has accomplished, and it has accomplished a lot. You cannot give up on that. Uh, and there are other people who say, well, you know what, the PLO has failed and it's time to build uh, something else. And I don't know what the clear answer is, but I do know uh, that whether it's in the PLO or whether it's outside of the PLO and it's a new initiative, organizations like Hamas cannot be excluded. Organizations like Islamic Jihad cannot be excluded, right? Palestinians in 48 and their political structures cannot be excluded. And so it has to be a model in which actually the, the Palestinian uh, movement or the Palestinian liberation structure is very diverse. It will include Islamists from Hamas to, to uh, communists and Marxists and seculars, uh, seculars and, and PFLPs of the world, um, but all committed to the same thing, all committed to what the red lines of Palestinian liberation are. And again, those red lines are clear, the right of return and the li right for liberation and self-determination in the entirety of Palestine. So how do, the, how do you deal with the whole question of um, Israel? What, what aspect of Israel to recognize? Um, how, how does the national movement deal with that big question? Because under international law, the argument is, you know, you can't have it both ways. International law grants Israel the right to exist within the 67 borders. That's, that's been upheld by the same, you know, world court that, you know, made a lot of news a few years ago in the context of the genocide um, petition that South Africa brought. So there's, there's a dilemma here in terms of, you know, calling for the dismantling of the state of Israel and creating one, you know, um, unified state where Israelis and Palestinians, Jews, Muslims and Christians and everyone are equal under the law uh, with the fact that Israel under international law does have um, an argument to make that it has the right to exist as a, as a state as we, as we understand it based on its 67 borders. How, does, how do Palestinian nationalists deal with that? Well, but Israel doesn't exist within the 67 borders. I mean, the idea that there are borders for Israel is just non, not factual. Israel doesn't have declared borders, and it's an expansionist state that, continu that actually maintains sovereign control from the river to the sea. That's illegitimate under international law because that's apartheid. It's a war crime, or it's a violation of international law. But, but I think the more interesting answer to that question is actually problematizing the idea of partition itself and the legitimation of Israel as a state within that. The, the idea of partition, that historic Palestine can be partitioned to create room for a Jewish state and to create room for a Palestinian state, is an illegitimate colonial tool. Partition is used by colonial masters or has historically been used by colonial masters without the, uh, uh, the desires and aspirations of the colonized being taken into account, and Palestinians are no uh, exception. The Balfour Declaration in 1917, which was the biggest imprimatur for the Zionist movement, to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine happened from the imperial power at the time without taking uh, into account the, the colonized subjects. The colonized subjects were not 
uh, Palestinians, they were seen as the non-Jewish inhabitants. That partition was then taken into the UN and institutionalized into the UN in the 1947 partition plan when all of the countries surrounding Palestine, whether in Asia or in Africa, voted against partition. All the countries that had declared, achieved independence from their colonial masters came out against partition. Palestinians came out against partition. So the idea that partition is legitimate under international law has to be hugely contested. The, the UN that passed partition was a UN that was still firmly within the grip of the colonial powers, right? And it's failed. If we're having this conversation in a world where there is a sovereign Palestinian state, one can say, okay, partition was maybe historically illegitimate. It's worked. Palestinians have self-determination. We're not in that world. We understand now that partition, the idea that Palestine can be partitioned, was never actually about partition. It was about maintaining the illusion of partition while Israel continues to exist as a non-partition state from the river to the sea, right? And so we need to try to also dislodge this idea that there's legitimacy or that partition was legitimate. But doesn't that push the prospects of Palestinian um, national rights down the road for some future that's unclear when it might manifest itself, as opposed to working within what is a broad international consensus that many countries believe in this two-state settlement. Here's is it, isn't that the trade-off? So how, how do you reconcile that? Here's the thing. If we are living in a world today where the trade-off is, let's give Palestinians their state to go for a two-state solution or to go for the full dismantlement of apartheid, I will sit with you and have a whole conversation about whether it's a one-state or a two-state debate. That's not the trade-off. The trade-off is, do we give the Palestinians a Bantustan under Israeli apartheid, or do Palestinians go for the full decolonization of Palestine? The Palestinian state is not on the table. It's never been on the table. There has never been any kind of effort diplomatically and internationally to create a territorially contiguous, fully sovereign Palestinian state on the 67 line. That discourse is an illusion. It's in the fantasies of policymakers. It was never actually about a two-state or full decolonization. It was about apartheid or full decolonization. And in that trade-off, my, my politics are clear, right? No, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. Okay. Um, Let's turn, let's turn it over to the audience. You've been sitting patiently. Um, I think there's a microphone. Um, that mi is there a microphone that's going to yeah, circulate? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I mean, we'll, we'll take as many questions as we can and start to wrap it up as after we get close to 8 o'clock, so we have a good hour. Um, so the floor is open. If you raise your hand, we'll... First question right there, second question there. Yes, yeah, so right at the back. Go ahead, and ask it without a microphone. Go ahead just ask it really loud, and I'll, I'll repeat the question. You can project your voice. Did everyone hear the question? The, so one of the things that we hear about the origins of Hamas is that Hamas was in many ways either supported or assisted by Israel to divide the Palestinian national movement when it first emerged. And, and, and thus, you know, Israel somehow had an interest in playing up, the, uh, playing up Hamas as a counterweight to the, to the PLO. Um, could you comment on that? So I'll give the, the historical reading about where, where that, that kind of take comes from. So Hamas obviously is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. And uh, throughout the 40s and the 50s uh, and 60s, it existed primarily as a social organization. So it believed, the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine believed that the road to liberation comes through Islamization that the first step is to Islamize the society, to make sure that people are living a virtuous life, and that that kind of society can then pave the way towards liberation. From the Israeli perspective, that was seen as not particularly challenging or threatening. And so the Muslim Brotherhood received 
licenses to operate throughout the Gaza Strip and, and the occupied territories after the occupation began in, in the 60s and the 70s. When Hamas was created, it flipped that uh, on its head. So rather than Islamization as a way to liberation, it began to believe that liberation, confronting the occupation was actually a prerequisite to the creation of an Islamized society. So when that happened, obviously the Israeli um, a reaction was to see that as a threatening turn, and that kind of symbiotic relationship which had existed before Hamas was created faltered afterwards. But in that gray moment, in the years before Hamas fully emerged as what Hamas became, there were instances in which uh, Israel would uh, refused to, so when uh, there would be skirmishes in the Gaza Strip or the occupied territories between the Islamists and the nationalists, and Israel wouldn't intervene. And that began the process of divide and rule that then culminated in what the Netanyahu government calls the separation policy, which is to maintain the Gaza Strip under Hamas separate from uh, the, the nationalists, quote unquote, and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So that, when Hamas emerged as a full faction, there were very clear divide and rule tactics. Now that emerged most powerfully, actually, after Hamas won the elections in 2006, because then Israel, uh, supported primarily by the US, uh, initiated a coup uh, operation, a regime change operation, in order to try to undermine Hamas's election victory and re-empower Fatah. And so that led to the civil war in 2007, which ultimately resulted in Hamas taking over. So the divide and rule tactics have always been there. Um, for the past 16 years, since 2007 till now, uh, Hamas existed in a very weird space in the Israeli political establishment in the sense that it was demonized as an ISIS-like uh, uh, organization, you know, brutal, extremely violent, the terrorist organization that was bent on Israel's destruction, and at the same time as this organization that was fundamental for Israel to maintain governance and stability in the Gaza Strip. So in some ways, Israel supported the movement, allowed it to, to continue to operate the way it did. And that's why I say, actually, Hamas became a fig leaf in which the Gaza Strip and the separation of the Gaza Strip was then justified under the rhetoric of terrorism. Yeah, you were next, yeah. Um, is there a microphone, is there a, just, you, you, you do it loud, you've got, yeah. Through the whole other part of the speech, there are two parties in Palestine. There's Hamas and Fatah, but Fatah is so useless. It doesn't represent anyone. This is a problem that they need to deal with. Uh, thank you for mentioning it, but what I wanted to ask you about is, I don't know if this is going too far, but the, the southern border at Rafah used to be like an escape valve, like they let off the steam. I'd like to understand, under 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 Mubarak and Bo and under Morsi, they this the doors were open every once in a while, but now by when they put in Zisi, who's a complete dictator and authoritarian, they've shut that down. And I I saw so much love from the Egyptian Palestinian, the Egyptian Arab, to his brothers in Palestine when I was going into Gaza, mm -hmm. but now it's just like. Where are the streets in, in Egypt? So what about the Egyptian side of this equation? Because it's more accurate to say that, you know, Gaza has been under a, an Israeli and Egyptian blockade, right, for the last 16 years. Egypt has a big role in it, but they don't get the type of criticism that I think they deserve for being part of this, you know, this trauma. So I'm, I'm never going to be one to try to go lightly on the, Israel, on the Egyptian uh, uh, regime, so I'll, I'll agree with that as a starting point, but I, I think there's a huge difference, which is the Gaza Strip is a part of Palestine, it's not a part of Egypt. And so that border between Palestine and Egypt, that's an international border for the Egyptians. Uh, the blockade, that's internal Palestine, right? That's the, the, the Israeli apartheid regime putting a blockade on one portion of Palestine. Um, and so they're not comparable. Uh, but yes, I think the Egyptians have a huge, um, have played a hugely destructive role in, in maintaining uh, the kind of oppression and isolation of the Gaza Strip. And that's been, uh, it's, it's changed under different iterations. So Mubarak used to turn a blind eye to the tunnels. So uh, Hamas was able to trade through the tunnels. 
even though there were obviously security agreements between Egypt and Israel, there was relative freedom. And this is largely how Hamas was able to survive the first few years of the blockade. And then when Morsi came, that obviously became a much easier uh, tr the crossing point between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. And then obviously since the Sisi regime came into power, that's been absolutely uh, not the case. And the Sisi regime is very intimately connected to Israel. And they, I believe, uh, share the goal actually of destroying the Gaza Strip and specifically destroying Hamas because for the, uh, the Sisi dictatorship specifically, the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. So this then flows into domestic politics within Egypt, which regards any form of Islamism as a form of terrorism. Um, yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, you're, you're next, and then uh, Medea, you had your hand up. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to use the mic. Use the microphone. Yeah, Tyke sort of took my question, but I was wondering if you could also look north and east. And I know that Hezbollah is Shia, and the uh, Hamas would be Sunni, correct? Uh, so I wonder if there are any links there or if they coordinate in any way, and also how does Jordan play into it? Obviously, Jordan's part of the peace process or cooperates with Israel. So, Yeah, so the, the relationship between Hezbollah and Hamas goes back to the beginning of the movement's founding. Uh, and actually, Hamas learned the tactic of suicide bombings from Hezbollah. Uh, in, a, in, in, in the early 90s, uh, uh, a significant portion of the leadership, of Hamas's leadership, was exiled by the Israelis to Lebanon in an attempt to get rid of Hamas as an early movement, and that totally backfired because in Lebanon they ended up obviously engaging with their counterpart in Hezbollah, and that created uh, quite a, a strong relationship between the two movements. Now, the fact that they're Shia and Sunni doesn't quite feature in the politics of the movement in the sense that uh, they're both committed to a political project, uh, which is, at least when it comes to Israel, are, is aligned. And that political project is obviously the liberation of Palestine. Now, one of the things that has been quite interesting to see and to watch since October 7th is the way that Hezbollah has responded to Israel's genocide. And obviously, everyone here probably had a big question mark in the first weeks after October 7th around whether Hezbollah would uh, enter the fray and engage or not. And it's been very interesting to see them choose to not. Um, and that, that, that has to also be understood within their own political calculus. They are currently in a country that, uh, for all intended purposes, has collapsed, is a failed state. Um, the idea that there would be another front uh, opening with, with Lebanon is something that would have been devastating for Lebanon, and I'm sure that Hezbollah uh, factored that quite highly in terms of taking that into consideration. I don't think that it's a fait accompli, that this won't become a regional war. I think if you look at this from the perspective of Netanyahu, uh, he's very interested in expanding because this is the only way that they, he can maintain his political career. And in order to be able to do that, he needs to obviously deal with the fact that now his military is quite overextended actually on the Gaza, uh, in the Gaza uh, assault. Uh, in Jordan, the situation is quite different. I mean, obviously, this is also existential for Jordan for a different reason, uh, for the fact that the majority of Palestinians, uh, the majority of Jordanian citizens are actually of Palestinian descent. So this is something that's, uh, that's hugely destabilizing. Uh, but more importantly, out of a fear of a possible uh, ethnic cleansing happening out of the West Bank and what that might mean for the, the Jordanian government. Um, now, the Jordanians have... Uh, in the past, obviously, they do have a, a peace treaty, as you say, but that peace treaty has always been quite a cold peace treaty, and it's been very frosty, I think, since, since October 7th. Um, Medea, you're next, but before you pose your question, um, th the previous question reminded me of one of the big sort of uh, themes that we hear about in the mainstream discussion of Hamas here in the United States, and that Hamas is a proxy for Iran. Could you, could you talk about the relationship between Iran and Hamas um, in some sort of objective way that shatters what we often hear in the mainstream media? Yeah, Hamas has actually over, over its, what, 35-year history now, a, a, a bit more, been very effective at maintaining its distance from its patrons. So it's very good as an organization at decision-making in a way that maintains its autonomy. 
from its patrons. And we see that in the way actually uh, Iran obviously is a huge uh, supporter of Hamas financially and militarily, but it hasn't always been. And there have been periods that are very rocky in Hamas's history where Iran, especially over the Syria file, where Iran was no longer a benefactor of Hamas, and that's because Hamas, um, after the protests began in Syria in 2011, took a position that's aligned with the protesters uh, against uh, what the Iranian uh, regime had asked, uh, requested at the time, and so put it at odds with the Iranian regime. Uh, and it still took that position, right? And so the movement hasn't ever, uh, I don't think, acted in the way, let's say, that Hezbollah has, which is to uh, operate against its own interests for Iranian interests. I, I haven't seen that in the way that the movement has, has acted. Um, and uh, since October 7th, you actually see that even the Iranians have been a bit surprised by the operation because they weren't informed of it before, at, at least from what I can tell. And so there is this shows, again, that Hamas, yes, gets support from different patrons. And, and it's very good at sometimes playing these patrons against each other. Now uh, they're settled in Doha, they talk to Turkey, you know, they're in Egypt, uh, but actually maintain a certain degree of independence. Medea. So I wish we could take you with us in the halls of Congress as we confront these Congress people. So how would you answer what we hear all the time is uh, Hamas wants to wipe Israel off the map, which they, they interpret as killing all Jews. And if there is a permanent ceasefire, Hamas will only regroup. And they have said they want to do s October 7th over and over again. I mean, this idea of, of Hamas wanting to wipe Israel off the map, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get my head around because I don't quite know what uh, is being referred to here. So, so if we just look at Hamas as a, as a political actor, and as a, obviously it's a military actor as well, but if we look at it as a political actor, the movement has actually offered uh, politically and diplomatically more than any Israeli political party has in terms of trying to reach some kind of a peace agreement. In its charter, um, uh, which was reissued in 2017, the movement accepted the creation of a Palestinian state on 1967 borders, uh, which no Israeli political party has. This is, so if we look at the Likud party, which is now in power, Hamas has offered more politically than uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's party ever has, right? And so the, the movement has offered time and time again political platforms that introduce opportunities for engagement, for political engagement, uh, that are always dismissed. And this goes back to the opening question that Nadir asked me, which is, why do the, the Israelis always deal with Hamas militarily, never politically? The, the political platform of the movement is never engaged with. The fact that the movement has offered um, lasting political uh, uh, offers have never actually seriously been considered. Rather, there's been a demonization of the movement as ISIS, as terrorism, as a way of deflecting from having to deal with the political um, with the political positions the movement has put forward. Because if there's genuine engagement with Hamas's political uh, offerings, actually it would be very embarrassing for Israel and the international community because they've offered more in terms of sustaining some kind of ceasefire than the Israelis ever have. So on, on I mean, this is a harder question to answer because what is October 7th? I mean, October 7th was a moment in which Hamas challenged the blockade and challenged the fact that the Gaza Strip can be maintained behind the blockade, right? If, that, that, uh, if, if disrupting that uh, blockade, if, if uh, targeting uh, Israel in a way to disrupt its, its apartheid regime, they do that over and over again, the answer is probably yes. Now, would they do the massacres that, they, that, that happened again on October 7th? I don't think Hamas uh, has ever um, really engaged with that question openly, so it's very hard to, to answer what that looks like. We have to think about what happened on October 7th, and we talked about this or in the lecture today. There's a fog of war around that. Uh, obviously, war crimes happened, 
uh, and obviously there needs to be a certain degree of accountability. But my reading of the situation is that Hamas had intended to achieve a certain kind of military blow against Israel's military bases around the Gaza Strip, and the operation ended up being much, much bloodier and much more extensive than that ambition. Speaking of Hamas, on this related point, how do you deal with the 1988 charter, which is violent, anti-Semitic, it's frequently brought up as an example that this, an orga this is an organization that you can't deal with, it has to be eradicated. How do you deal with that as a scholar of the topic? Yeah, the, the, the Hamas charter in 1988 was an anti-Semitic document in that it peddled a lot of anti-Semitic tropes and specifically using the protocols of the elders of Zion. So they used the uh, anti-Semitic um, a reading that Jews control the world uh, and that Jews are, uh, they drive finance, they drive media, so obviously all the, the historic anti-Semitic tropes. Um, and over the years, and I think the charter was issued at a time when, so it was issued about six months after Hamas was uh, uh, established as a, as a movement. Uh, and over the years, the leaders tried to distance themselves from the charter uh, for various reasons, not just its anti-Semitism, but other, other factors as well. Um, and that became a part of the way they dealt with their announcements, with their bayana, their statements, would often um, try to put forward language and discourse that was misaligned with the movement, uh, with, the, with the charter, sorry. And that then was formalized in 2017. So in 2017, Hamas issued an amended charter. Um, this is one of the last things that Khaled Mishal did on his way out. Mm -hmm. And in the amended charter, the movement speaks very openly about distinguishing Zionism from Judaism and does away with all of the anti-Semitic tropes that it had peddled in. Um, and this is where it puts forward the idea of a, of a partition around, around 67. And that charter, I think, was the culmination of uh, all of the positions that Hamas has been had been taking as a political party for the decades before that were not engaged in. And the charter, the amended charter also wasn't engaged in. Netanyahu said it was um, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing and used that obviously to continue demonization. There's questions at the back and, uh, that I want to get to. At the very end, yeah. Just wait, wait for the microphone so people can at the front can hear you. And I saw other hands, I'll get to you as well. No, it's not on. Okay, go for it. Yes. <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? Okay, go ahead. Um, I think the, look, I think the movement here has been incredible, I have to say, since, since October 7th, the, the mobilization that's been happening in the U.S. has been phenomenal and exceeded um, my expectations at least in the sense that I'd never seen, I'd never thought that there could be that kind of mobilization in the streets in D.C. or in New York in, in, in solidarity. And I think organizations have been doing a phenomenal job. I think there's obviously a few, a few things, a few um, asking points that are uh, fundamental. The first, obviously, is military aid, is ending all forms of military aid and military support by Israel to, uh, uh, by the U.S. to Israel. Uh, and I think this is becoming more and more an issue um, that's actually about domestic politics as well. The U.S. has obviously always been supportive of Israel, and uh, now the U.S. is active in genocide. Uh, and this is something that is horrifying, or should be horrifying, to American citizens. And I think pushing on that uh, is something that is fundamental, and there's a lot of avenues here, right? The, f the federal district court in California in January said that there's a plausible case of genocide to be brought against the Biden administration. That's a huge, that's a huge entry point, and this is something that should be pursued. The other thing that is fundamental, I think, is to push back against the idea that we can go back to October 6th that we can go back to the idea that let's restart a peace process, let's talk about the two-state solution, and everyone can sing Kumbaya. I think the idea that the, there's a return to that notion of partition has to be really contested. We're not talking about two-state solutions, we're talking about fundamental Palestinian freedom. How do we dismantle apartheid, which is a 
a, a crime uh, under international law. That has to be the starting point of any conversation with American interlocutors. Um, and the last, the last thing, which is something that's already happening, but I do think that it's something we should conceptualize and, and bring to the fore of our consciousness all the time, which is that Palestine isn't separate from the issues here around, uh, around uh, systemic racism, around police violence, around all of the issues that plague this country with its history of, of, of uh, slavery and with, uh, with its continued uh, racism, right? The, the, f the fight for decolonization in Palestine is fundamental for the fight for decolonization here. And bringing those links out continuously, I think, is fundamental for an international movement. Um, on a related point, we're in an election year. What advice do you have to Palestine activists on who to vote for or what to do? Vote for Biden, vote for Trump, boycott the election. What do you say? <laughs> I mean, somebody is going to be in the White House in January, right? So, I mean, I, th I personally think Trump is a million times worse on many other issues. But of course, I understand people who can't vote for Biden, given what we've seen. But, you know, we have to make a decision, and there's three options. So, w what are your thoughts? Thankfully, I don't have to vote in the US. <laughs> I'll say one sentence in response to this, which is that I hope that Biden loses because of this genocide. Yeah, okay. yeah qu question right there. Just keep your hand up, the microphone's gonna come. Uh, hello, thank you so much. So we spoke earlier about the, the PLO and Fatah, uh, just forget it, yeah, just... So question about what would you like to see about the Israeli left? How relevant is it at this particular moment in terms of trying to push things in the direction of some just settlement? I mean, I think the Israeli left has lost its way. Uh, if we think about the protests that happened in Israel in the first part of last year, the fact that Palestine was absent from those protests suggests that the Israeli left thinks you can have democracy in apartheid. Right? They think that you can have a democracy for Jews only, and that that's a, that's a good goal to be mobilizing towards. Uh, so I think there needs to be a fundamental re reorientation in terms of what the Israeli left is um, doing and what its political program is, because it's not a left anymore. It's, it's actually pretty right-wing now. Uh, having said that, I think the Israeli left is fundamental eventually for the struggle for Palestinian liberation because they are fundamental in what one of the things that I was talking about earlier in this um, discussion in, in what I'd like to think of as decomposing Zionism. To dismantle Zionism, you need the left. You need to understand, you need a, 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 an Israeli constituency that's able to separate Zionism from Judaism right, that's able to mobilize for Palestinian liberation. Uh, and I think that that's a fundamental part. Right now, it doesn't exist. Right now, there's no Israeli left that's effective. Um, and I think that's something that is, um, for any Israeli that's har who's horrified by the fact that they live in an apartheid regime, that should be their immediate um, call to action. A question, a question right here, yeah. Um, Try the microphone. It hasn't been. It's been. It's been off and on all night. Well, af after this onslaught, uh, this genocide that's going on, where the target supposedly is Hamas, but it certainly isn't. How many people in Hamas do you think are left? How many of the fighters do you think military fighters do you think might be left? I don't. I don't have the exact answer to that question. I think it's very difficult to to know. I do think, or at least let me put it this way, I am comfortable saying that militarily Hamas has done much better and survived the onslaught much better than is being represented and, cer and certainly than what the Israeli government would like to think. Um, Israel is losing 
on the battlefield in the sense that none of its strategic objectives have been met. Hamas hasn't had to do anything that fundamentally yet shows that it's on the losing side of this. It's very difficult to say this when there's 31,000 plus people killed. But if we're thinking about this in, in a very cold way in terms of the military, uh, Israel is overextended and its military has never been actually weaker or more, more defeated. Question here at the front and then you're, s you're next. And then I'll go to the other side of the room. Go ahead. Um, you spoke earlier about fragmentarianism um, and various different groups. And so I was wondering if you could speak more to um, perceptions uh, amongst Palestinians of, of some of these various groups, Hamas, but also um, other groups, and if you think there are any key areas of unity or fragmentarian, uh, fragmentation um, within those perceptions, kind of what you think is the path forward on, on that. You just pass the microphone behind you. Uh, so it, it's a very difficult question, and it's a, dif it's a difficult question to answer specifically in the heat of this moment, because there is very understandably, uh, especially from Palestinians in Gaza, from many Palestinians in Gaza, a huge sense of abandonment, right, that there hasn't been mobilization across historic Palestine. There's been incredible mobilization globally. Uh, but within historic Palestine, Palestinians in, in 48, in Israel, and in the West Bank haven't mobilized as much as one would hope in solidarity, not just in solidarity, in, in, uh, alongside the Palestinians in Gaza. And we know the reasons for that. We know that the PA in the West Bank has been on an extensive arrest campaign. Uh, uh, the Israelis have... Uh, uh, tortured and imprisoned and, and uh, done a whole host of things to Palestinians, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel. So that's created more fragmentation, I think, or more of a sense of a fragmentation there mi than might have existed, let's say, at the height of unity in 2021, when uh, there was this very clear unity in all of historic Palestine against Israel's uh, apartheid. But I think this is a passing moment. And I think we need to sort of hold on to what 2021 gave us, which is that there are fundamentals, regardless of the political affiliation, regardless of where you lie under geographically under Israeli apartheid, there is unity on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals have been consistent for more than uh, you know, a century, uh, which is that the Palestinians have a right to their homeland. And that is something that has to be the basis for a unity, right? And that, that needs to be something that's politically engaged with to allow it to emerge. Go ahead. Hi. So uh, first off, I'd just like to thank you. I'm the uh, assistant director of a pro-Palestine bookstore here in D.C., Middle East Books and More. And it's been great to have uh, such a clear and concise text such as yours to recommend when people come in and ask, like, I don't know anything about anything. Uh, please, like, point me in the right direction. And this has been really phenomenal in that sense. Uh, my question is about the other movements that have kind of aligned with Hamas as far as the kind of Israel-Gaza war goes, uh, specifically the PFLP and the DFLP. And their kind of historic relations with Hamas uh, and their sort of role as agreeing with Hamas in that the PA is clearly like kind of a collaborative organization with, uh, with Israel. But at the same time, there are very kind of clear uh, ideological differences between the organizations. And I'm kind of curious about how those, uh, they coexisted pre-October 7th in Gaza specifically, and what you think this uh, kind of increased military coordination now uh, could look like in the future, and what it might bode uh, going forward. And in answering that question, explain what these acronyms mean, because most people don't know what PLF, PLFP stands for. And I don't even think most people know what the PA stands for, if you could just clarify that. Uh, first of all, I think I need to come visit your bookstore. It sounds yeah. great, and thank you for, for coming um, and recommending my book to your poor readers. Uh, so, I, I, so look, Hamas has actually been very effective. Uh, so I'll talk before October 7th, has been very effective at working with other factions inside the Gaza Strip. Um, 
And I don't want to give the impression that there was political plurality in Gaza because Hamas was obviously the governing body and that no political faction really challenged that. Uh, but in terms of the way that Hamas dealt with some of the operations, the military operations predating October 7th, they had a, 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 a um, the name is uh, escaping me, me now, but basically a committee of all of the factions within the Gaza Strip to coordinate uh, strategically and to, go to coordinate militarily. And for example, when the 2018 Great March of Return was happening, uh, this wasn't the way that it unfolded. Uh, obviously, it started as a, as a civil, uh, civilian uh, protest. Eventually, Hamas uh, participated and engaged in the protest, but it was alongside other factions, including some of the organizations you mentioned, PFLP and DFLP, which are the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. So those organizations are, are leftist organizations. They're secular organizations. So obviously, ideologically, they're misaligned with Hamas. But tactically, there was always a kind of engagement that transcended that ideology. So it was a, an engagement on strategic issues, on tactical issues, on military issues. And I actually think that that's the healthiest expression of what a future liberation should look like. Because the liberation movement can never be uniform. It can, or rather not uniform, it can never be monochromatic. It can't be a singular ideology. Any liberation movement is diverse. It has to be incredibly diverse to hold the diversity of the people that are fighting for liberation, right? The liberation movement has to be feminist and Islamist and uh, 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 take positions on LGBTQ and, and be capitalist and be communist. The liberation movement has to be diverse because the Palestinian people are diverse. So th that diversity, however, cannot also be a form of disunity. It has to be a united diversity in the sense that everyone's converging against the clear red lines that make up Palestinian politics. And within that divergence, uh, or within that convergence, there's a diversity of ideology. And I think Hamas, the way that it operated in the Gaza Strip modeled some of that, actually. Um, not, uh, not, uh, not to sort of say that there wasn't authoritarian tendencies, there were. Uh, but there was a certain kind of modeling of what uh, um, a cross-factional commitment to s the same strategic goals could look like. Uh, yeah, you're next. Um, you just use the microphone. Hopefully it'll work. First of all, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for especially going on the Ezra Klein podcast. That was really helpful for getting to like my neoliberal you know, relatives. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed that nuanced conversation. But I wanted to ask that um, some, some conversation we tend to have a lot, at least on the left, is kind of the validity of like peaceful versus violent protest. Um, and I was wondering if you have any insight into that, just in terms of other historical liberation movements, uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, uh, I'll talk about other mov movements in a second, but just in terms of uh, Palestine specifically, you know, there's a long history of questioning and engaging with whether armed resistance works or not. Um, and it's never a clear answer. Uh, and Hamas specifically, since we're talking about Hamas, really struggled with this question. Uh, because when it was uh, engaged in the Second Intifada, at least in the first half of the Second Intifada, it, I think it actually believed that suicide bombings would force Israel to withdraw its settlements. That the, the suicide bombings were painful enough for the Israeli electorate that they would force their government to pull back their settlements. And halfway through the Second Intifada, I think Hamas realized that actually the suicide bombings are having the other intended effect, which is to allow Sharon to retrench in the occupied territories under the 9 11, the, the war on terror doctrine. And so strategically, they had failed. And we see that moment of transition actually play out for the movement as they began to think about moving from armed resistance to political resistance, to thinking about elections, to thinking about how they can take their resistance platform off the military battlefield and into the political battlefield. So I really do think that the movement engaged with that in a way that's sep separate from, let's say, how Fatah engaged with it, which is to lay down their arms. Hamas didn't. It said our fingers on the trigger, but we're not pulling the trigger. We're engaging with this politically, but we will go back to military resistance if we're forced. And indeed, that's what's happened, because politically, 
All avenues for engagement on the political front have been shut. And what's the lesson that Hamas is learning? That the BDS is now, what, anti-Semitic and violent, so there's no point in going down the popular resistance route. There's uh, the Great March of Return, which was one of the biggest, most uh, extensive forms of popular mobilization in Palestinian history, and it's met with more than 36,000 Palestinians maimed right, with nothing from the international community. And so the message is clear that, okay, armed resistance might strategically not be the best form, but actually it's the only thing that's getting concessions from, from Israel. And so I think that Hamas understands that there are other forms of resistance. There's diplomatic and legal and popular and economic, but it has been um, uh, uh, put up against the wall con continuously in terms of being forced to rely on armed resistance as a way of getting concessions. Now, other, other uh, liberation struggles have also engaged with that. There's always been this kind of uh, both popular mobilization as versus armed resistance, including here in the US, right? The civil rights movement was often peaceful and popular, but also often not. And, and this is the same in South Africa, the same in Ireland. So I think that Palestine is not exceptional in, in, in that way. And I think our challenge is to make sure that that resistance, whether it's armed or peaceful or uh, whatever it is, is in service of a clear political project rather than one that's, you know, just for the for, uh, sort of not, not building towards that liberationist ideal. Does everyone in the audience know what the 2018 Great March of Return was all about? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, this is an educated audience. I just wanted to be sure, because you made reference to it, and I, I, I just wanted to make sure people knew what you were talking about. Oh, yeah, can you say something about it, because for those people who don't know what 2018 Great March of Return was all about. So the Great March of Return was a movement that began on land day um, in March, which uh, commemorates the, the Israeli killing of Palestinians in Israel. So these are Palestinian citizens of Israel who were marching to... Uh, to bring back their land, which had been uh, uh, taken by the Israeli government. So it's a marker in, in uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, calendar of, of, of the struggle. Um, and so the Great March of Return was a march that was meant to start on Land Day and end on Nakba Day, so between March and May. And for that period, uh, Palestinian civil society throughout the Gaza Strip mobilized. They went to uh, the so-called border, so this is the fence area that separates Gaza from the rest of Palestine, and they mobilized for their right to return. So again, Gaza is majority refugees from lands that are now in 48, and they mobilized to return home. It was a largely peaceful protest, and you know they sang, they danced, they just basically camped out around the fence area, and it had a very carnival-like atmosphere. Before the protests had even begun, Israel deemed them, quote-unquote, terror marches. And it positioned snipers in dunes just beyond the periphery, the Gaza periphery, periphery uh, with clear guidelines to shoot with the intention of killing. And over the course of that period, anyone who would be within the sniper's uh, range of fire would be hit. Uh, the International Criminal Court started an investigation, which obviously the Israelis boycotted, and uh, showed that there was the intention to kill and that Israel was engaging in war crimes. And this was going on not for days, it was going on for weeks. Um, and the protesters kept coming back and the Israelis kept snipering and then they started attacking journalists and medics and so on and so forth. At some point, after I think a few months, Hamas intervened and began leveraging the protests to engage the Israeli military more actively given that the civilian population was defenseless in the face of Israeli firepower. Okay, maybe one or two more okay. questions and this we'll start is, um, to This is wrap actually going to be our um, last question. Oh, last question? Okay. Oh, yeah. Last question then. Um, d you had your hand up. This man at the right in the front, yeah. Oops, sorry. You had your hand up? Okay, how about one more question after this? Does that work? Okay, yeah, okay. Mine, Second mine to last question. Mine will be short. Thanks for coming, Tarek. Um, can I bring you back to what I understood you to say that the Israeli left is crucial or pivotal to the future of Palestinian liberation. I'm having a hard time scoring that with the empirical reality that 
labor governments have been <coughs> as Zionist or even more Zionist if we only look at settlement building. Yeah, I, and so to clarify, I'm not talking labor. Uh, so the Israeli left as it exists today, uh, and, and to, it's an important clarification, as I said, is, is right wing. It's not left. I'm saying there needs to be an active anti-Zionist Israeli constituency, an active, actually leftist uh, Israeli. So, so there isn't, it doesn't exist today. But uh, what I'm saying is that there needs to be a kind of a contestation domestically within Israel by Israelis against fascism, right? Against the, uh, the apartheid regime they're living in. Today that doesn't exist. But I think for a future of a liberated Palestine, breaking the stranglehold of apartheid on Israeli citizens is crucial. And so an active left, and here I'm talking left as in the traditional left, not the Israeli left, is, is crucial. Okay, last question, the woman at the back, um, if you just, yeah, the microphone is right there, go ahead. If you can come to the front, you can speak to this microphone, if you don't mind. No, no, but we're recording it, so we need, to, we need you to speak into the microphone, if you don't mind. It works now? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I want to say, mashallah alaik. <laughs> we are very proud of you. Uh, it's just a wondering in my, in my brain, you know, is there any possibility that Israel knew about the uh, Hamas mission in Israel? And uh, especially, and you know, Israel is the top technology in spying and uh, security matter, that thing, you know. And Israel let the mission go to, to give itself an excuse uh, to do what it does uh, uh, in, in, in Gaza, yeah. to, to do that genocide, I mean. Thank you. Thank I, I, this is bother me a lot. I hope it's, I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, I actually get this question all the time. And I think, yes, and I think it's really important to, to talk about it. So I, um, the short answer is no. And the, the reason why I don't think Israel knew is actually very simple, which is racism. I think that there is no way that Israel, and there were intelligence reports from Israeli intelligence officials saying that there might be an operation from the Gaza Strip that were all ignored. And the reason they were ignored is racism. There was never a belief that Palestinians could actually strategically and militarily deal a powerful blow to Israel. There was a complete dismissal of the possibility of actually Palestinians being able to take their fate in their own hands. That's why there was an intelligence failure. It's racism. Now, I don't like giving that idea any life because it takes agency away from Palestinians. Palestinians did this. Palestinians did October 7th for good or for bad, and the Palestinians have agency, and this is what they did. What was unexpected was the failure of Israeli intelligence, because Palestinians had, and others globally, have thought that actually the Israeli apartheid regime is invincible. It's actually not invincible. It kind of folds like a house of cards. So I think that's one of the biggest lessons that comes out of October 7th, and we should hold on to it. Please join me in thanking Tarek Bakoni for being with us tonight.